Hey everybody and welcome to the Vassals of King's Graves, Agatha Christie reread. My name is Bina007 and I'll be your host today for our 18th episode. We'll be covering Death in the Clouds, aka Death in the Air, published originally in 1935. I'm so pleased for this gorgeous and Hercule Poirot and Spectre Jack mystery that I'm joined by Hannah. Hello, it's Wing Shadow from the forums. And I'm feeling very English today as it is overcast and quite chilly and wet. (laughs) Same same exact weather over here, Hannah. And by Xander. Hello, it's uh, Xander, the Lord Baron. And despite it snowing the other day, it is um, 50 and sunny today. Uh, Well, I'm glad to have you guys with me. And and Xander, we're back with a proper through and through Hercule Poirot mystery. Death in the Clouds is often not seen as one of the kind of classic you know, top of the line Agatha Christie's. But I found as I was rereading this, and I haven't read it in about 20 years, that I was actually very locked into the intricacies of the plot. I really enjoyed it. Xander, you've never read it before. How did you find this uh, detective story? Honestly, this is probably the one that um, least sucked me in out of all of them so far. Mm, it is. It has that reputation. Wow, really? Because I did like the characters and I got less interested in the mystery Ooh. and everything that was going on. It was it, it was just mm. at this point, I'm so dialed into Christie's characters that now that's what I'm looking forward to rather than the mysteries. Mm-hmm. Gosh, interesting take. So that's interesting because we're going to come at it from a different angle when we get into the character discussion. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it as much, though. Don't worry, we've got a hum. I'm I'm scared now of overhyping ABC murders. No, there's, but I not, really there's a really good one coming. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's really good because it's Hastings, it's Jap. It's I think Poirot. especially given what he just said. Yeah, it's characters are amazing. Yeah, exactly. How about you, Hannah? I have never read this one before. Oh, this one has okay. skipped my goes. So um, I I liked it. Uh, I didn't like it at first. I don't necessarily care a great deal for the end, but I did like the middle. I thought the middle was fun and uh, I definitely didn't know. I I had no clue. Uh, I had some suspicions, but I didn't know. I didn't solve it. And uh, there's a lot of fascinating cultural stuff about the time period that I think we get in this one where we don't really get in such other books as like parallel and house is sort of self-contained right um there's certain Mm. things here and there and they go to the hospital at one point but it's very isolated among one class and one location whereas death in the clouds kind of spans a lot more and i think it comes out in the writing more for me this time maybe it's just that i never caught it before but to me i felt like there was a lot more like these throwaway cultural references that were very specific to the 30s and especially being an english woman in the 30s that uh you know i would catch myself wanting to stop and then look it up um and there's a lot of stuff that i did look up about aviation back then to check the accuracy so i have a ton of notes on um what i think this universal airlines and the prometheus was in oh, my life. Cool. Okay, well, we'll definitely get into that. I do think there's something really lovely and luxurious about the fact that Agatha Christie is at this point, she's 45, she's very successful. Being a wealthy female writer is tasting some of the luxuries of life, the Orient Express, air travel, will get to death on the Nile as well. And so you get to live a little bit through her lives. And again, I also found it fascinating to see, oh my God, you know, the pioneers of commercial air travel, this is what it was like. So... Let's get into it. And dear listener, as always, we'll talk a little bit about context, the characters, adaptations, how the text has or hasn't held up to modern standards, um, but all spoiler free. And then after the end credits music, we'll get into the solution, how it compares maybe to other books that we've read in the series um, and some of the spoilery <coughs> stuff. So I'm also going to get into some of the stuff in the end credits about what happens in the two various Um, three-act tragedy versions, the US and UK, because a listener on YouTube very kindly really spelled it out and and helped clarify that. So I'll I'll fill you in on that one too. So if you haven't read three-act tragedy, you should probably avoid the spoiler part of this as well. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, We're getting lots of Christie verse overlap. There's a really funny bit where Inspector Jap says, everyone can't have done it. And for those of us who've read our Christie, we know that that refers actually to a case. 
there's also a bit where the detective in the novel, Clancy, is researching with his Bradshaw's Railway Guide about the 755 train from Trabazon. So, you know, clear references to Orient Express. We have a man in the brown suit and we have uh, Monsieur Giraud, the French um, inspector, makes a reference to murder from the links. So there's some nice little Christie verse stuff going on there. Not as much actually as ABC Murders. That has a lot, but there's a fair amount going on in this one. And let's get into setting in context that Hannah, how far do you think this ref- this this novel depicts commercial air travel? Is it accurate? The very first commercial flight took off from St. Petersburg, Florida in on New Year's Day, 1914. That is so much earlier than Way I would earlier have than I thought. Yeah. yeah, the man who um, owned the airline, uh, it was uh, him, I believe, piloting it and a single passenger took a 20 minute flight around the bay, including one stop um, in 1914 on New Year's Day. So that was really something. Um, one thing to keep in mind here uh, that I do feel like doesn't is maybe one of the bigger inaccuracies is that most commercial airlines were not pressurized until 1938. The pressurization machine was not installed in most airlines until 1938. So they would have been flying at a very low altitude, under 15,000 feet. They would have had freezing temperatures, a lot of turbulence, and above all things, it would have been extremely loud in the cabin to the point where um, the motor of the tin goose or the the Ford tri-motor could be up to 120 dB decibels. Hearing loss begins to occur at plus 85 dBs over an extended period of time. Put that in perspective. This would be louder than a rock concert. Stewards would use megaphones to interact with passengers. Commercial flight was also very slow at this time. A flight from New York to Los Angeles could take up to 25 hours. A transcontinental trip could take a week or more and cost in 1930s currency $200, which is almost $10,000 today. Um, And they called them world tours. Most planes would be full of mail more than they were of passengers. Air travel was certainly an activity for the elite. Pan Am's flying boat, the Clipper, also known as a seaplane, they called it that because it could land on water and it literally had all the amenities you would expect to find aboard a a major sea liner like the Titanic, something like the White Star Line. They had separate gender bathrooms, staterooms with bunk beds, separate dining compartments. It was like being on a flying hotel, a flying five-star hotel. The 1930s sees the first metal fuselages. Prior to this, they were made of wood or fabric. The average cruising airspeed is about 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour um, uh, before the 1930s in the decade before, so in the 20s. And then in the 1930s, we see it rise to 200 miles per hour or somewhere around 320 kilometers per hour. Uh, which by today is like nothing that's, I think they're doing more than that when they're taxiing. Uh, Passengers and luggage would be weighed on the tarmac for fuel calculation. Passenger weight is now estimated based on your ID or passport and done automatically for you. Um, And here's where it gets interesting. This is what I believe is the inspiration for Death in the Clouds, although I tried to research exactly and seeing if I could have like a quote of Christy saying this was what her inspiration was. So this is conjecture truly, but I do believe I'm onto something. The giant British airline, the Hanley Page Hannibal, the first of its fleet of the eight largest passenger machines in the world, made its first successful flight uh, in 1932. Um, It was a biplane with four forward mounted prop engines close to the fuselage and two affixed engines on the land, the leading edges of the two were affixed at the leading edge of the top wing, two were affixed at the leading edge of the bottom wing, wider out. They advertise this as being very far away from the body of the plane to give it a more quiet experience. But if if you do, if you're able to look at a uh, the Hanley Page Hannibal, you'll see that they are very close to the fuselage by our standards. So I'm not sure how much quieter it would have been up there for them. The horizontal tail wing was supported by three vertical stabilizers, each with a rudder at the back. This was Imperial Airways, which was HQ'd in Croydon, UK. It was established in 1924 as a, quote, 
It represents a British reply to the German challenge for air supremacy and commercial aircraft construction. Fully loaded, it weighed about 13 tons. Its cruising speed was around 105 miles per hour or 170 kilometers per hour. The fixed in place ground gear wheels were about four to five feet tall. Imperial Air merged with British Overseas Airways Corporation in 1939. And in 1974, that became known as British Airways. So she was probably flying and riding about an airline company that ultimately became British Airways that we know today. Um, the pictures are nuts when you Google the airplane. Um, isn't it? Because you have the kind of the normal sticky out wings that we're used to. Then this whole like massive through and through like wing, like uni wing that goes across the top. And yeah, these, the three fins at the back are just nuts. It's, um, it's so right. fascinating. Yeah. We, a vertical stabilizer like that now would not, it wouldn't really work in the altitude that they're, they're getting at in our, in our jets. That wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't uh, provide enough vertical stabilization. That's why we have those big ones that go way, way, you know, they're 20 feet tall in some cases. Um, you, and I imagine that you would be risking quite a lot of rudder hard over in a situation like this. If these, if the lines that lead all three of these rudders are not redundant, yeah. if one of them were to fail, you know, you could be looking at, um, quite a disaster. And there were several, there were four major disasters with the airline, um, at the time of the publication of her book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because a lot of what you've talked about there is picked up in the book. So, reader, as this book opens, Akil Poirot is taking a flight from Paris back to back to London or Croydon, as the airport is here. And you have the the motley crew of people on the flight. So, effectively, it's a closed door or closed house mystery, just as we had on Murder in the Orient Express, because the only people who can have committed the murder are the people in the airline cabin or maybe the stewards. And so that's the kind of the setup of it. But the whole kind of opening section is phenomenal because you're just sitting there as a modern person thinking, oh, my God, they're eating like a three course meal on this flight. And what kind of blew my mind is that they're sort of they're paying for the meal as if in a restaurant for what you ordered. And they have to tip the waiter almost like tipping the air steward, which kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they do mention the noise, actually, how noisy it is and how much the, the turbulence is getting to poor Monsieur Ocule Poirot's um, stomach, stomach. And, and Xander, I really thought of you when he's like, with all this turbulence, I'm just reduced to a mere normal person. My brain is not <laughs> like it's reduced him to yeah. mere mediocrity. <laughs> You I definitely how... felt him in that. <laughs> I hate... The whole thing just tickled my fancy. I love this idea of, you know, the romance of the air and this idea of you've got aristocrats and professional people and this one lady who's won basically the sweepstakes. And it just feels so romantic. But there's so much in this. Which would that... be the only way she could afford it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was quite expensive. The um, what else got me in this book is just technology in general seems so much more advanced, but so much more wondrous. There's a point where um, Hercule Poirot later on is going to make a trunk long distance call to Canada. And and even Hercule Poirot was rational and little grey cells as he likes to pretend to be, says, quote, it is romantic, you know, the transatlantic telephone to speak so easily to someone nearly halfway across the globe. And I was like, they really had long distance calls in those days? That just blew my mind. <laughs> Yeah, and then I was thinking about what it was like calling my friend who moved back to Japan in high school and the like delay and the shitty quality of that on my landline. Yeah. And I was just thinking, what would a call like that to Canada, number one, what would it cost? And number two, what would the quality be? There's also another then. point where um, Hercule Poirot faxes a photo. And I had no idea you could fax a photo telephonically in those days. That To me, the fax machine is something from my youth, like from the 1980s. It was new technology. But what do I know? Um, I know it's always crazy when you go and you look up like sewing machine and you look at the date on when the first like quote unquote sewing machine and they're talking about something like very primitive to what we use now, but and rare. But still, it's like, you know the 17th century it's things like that where you're just like well, i would have never guessed and and, and like the basic the technology first commercial flight, works I would have, the same i would have never said that the first commercial flight was in 1914 yeah that blows your mind right absolutely blows your mind 
So another oh, interesting cultural reference is that up until this point, you know, this is now 1935, and hitherto we've not really had Agatha Christie refer to the stock market crash or the Great Depression, but it, it makes a number of references here. Like it, it starts coming up and it will come up in other books as well. So she refers, there's a, a character called Xeropoulos, who's a Greek um, antique dealer in Paris. And he refers to the fact that because the Americans over there, somewhere over there, they've had a depression. And so he can't fleece them for fake antiques as much as he used to. So that's an interesting little throwaway line. Yeah, that one really got me. I was, I, I just never realized that it was so contained to the United States. I just sort of figured like, obviously they don't have the kind of globalized economy we do now, but I figured there's some spillover now. And yeah, I mean, even I, my, I my, really my, thought that was yeah. a factor leading up to World War II. Me too, especially in like, I really thought that this was a global thing. So maybe, yeah, who knows? I mean, I should know, right? Because I studied economic history, but I really thought it was more global than that. But then there's a really funny thing where Cicely Horbury, Lady Horbury, who's a British aristocrat, um, you know, they're talking about, you know, she has a very unhappy marriage, but she doesn't want to be divorced because she likes her status. And she's having a conversation with um, her evil arch enemy, the Honourable Venetia Kerr. No, actually, this is with Hercule Poirot. And she says, there aren't any millionaires anymore. And then Poirot says, well, the man who had three million now has two million. So they're not, you know, the world's smallest violin, which I thought was quite funny that Agatha Christie via Poirot is not making too much uh, spilled milk and crying tears over people who lost a million in the Great Depression when they still have some millions. But... So even even for Poirot and for Cicely Horbury, there's obviously this understanding that, um, yeah, that there's less money floating about. And and even with the archaeologists, they're saying there's a father and son who are archaeologists on the plane, French archaeologists, and they rely on private fundraising. And they're saying, actually, it's much harder to raise funds anymore. Apparently, Akil Poirot's wealth is untouched by the Depression, though, because he offers to fund an expedition at the end of the novel. So um so, so it's sort of like they go from Great Gatsby to P. Diddy's White Party, which we all know is far, far inferior. Yeah, exactly. Um, First world problems. Hmm. Um, other little cultural stuff going on in the 1930s. You still have a little bit of P.G. Woodhouse. So the, the country lawyers are called Fuchs, Fuchs, Wilbraham and Fuchs with double F's because the aristocracy. I think Agatha Christie loves to make up silly aristocratic names. Um, you have the Lions Corner House, which was a very big thing, actually. The idea that young women who were single, like the hairdresser, who's the star of the story, could just go and eat unaccompanied at a Lions Corner House it was quite a big social kind of revolution. And quite sort of liberating that you didn't have to be chaperoned. You could just go and eat yourself. Um, but divorce is still seen as socially undesirable and a bit sort of, gosh, if we can avoid it, we should. So, you know, you've got the liberation of women in one sense, but in the other sense, kind of social mores are still quite, I guess, restrictive. Um, let's get into characters. Xander, who was your favourite, if any, because maybe the the not having the good characters... I don't know. Um, you tell me. Who did you love on the plane? Honestly, I quite like Jane Grey. Um, I think, again, it's just, you know, Agatha Christie kind of inserting herself in a, like, almost a, 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 a useful, youthful fantasy experiment kind of thing. You know, like, oh, if I were this young again, what if I acted this way? How would it work out kind of stuff? And I feel like you can, act, like, really see that. I can completely agree. And I think a lot of her characters, when she started to make money, they're often like 10 years younger than her, but people who've almost by accident come into money and then are just enjoying the luxurious pleasures of life. And you can see the similarity with Catherine Gray in Murder on the Blue Train, who comes into an inheritance and then books herself on a luxurious train on holiday to the South Coast. There's a kind of joy of being kind of like a hardworking middle class girl who's like, oh, I'm suddenly on a, on a plane and it's so romantic and I'm going to Paris. And yeah, I think it's really lovely to make her the point of view because... She's kind of our, our sort of avenue into this kind of world of aristocrats and other people, I guess. Um, anyone else you liked or didn't like as a character? I mean, obviously, Poirot. He's always so much fun. I don't know. Everybody else is kind of... It's not that they're boring, but it's very familiar character she's written before, just with different names and slightly different backgrounds. 
Yeah, I agree. There's a little bit of sameness. I did. I, for me, I really like the two women. I think she writes great women. He's clearly she like, absolutely does. Yeah, Jane you know, Green's smart and she's um, resourceful, and she, you know, she's part of the action, part of the detection team, which I love. But you also have um, Lady Cicely Horbury, who I think is really funny. Um, well, not really funny, but I think quite tragic in some ways. But she's obviously this very pretty woman who has married an Aristo, but doesn't like him very much. And she's got a gambling addict. She probably has a bit of a cocaine habit. So a very modern character in some respects. But she's kind of like quite bitchy towards Venetia Kerr, the Honourable Venetia Kerr. And then Venetia Kerr's quite bitchy back. And I just think there's something really honest about the way Agatha Christie writes female rivalry. Like it's really unashamed. Agreed, yeah. <laughs> and they just like, they mm. sit there, you get on the first scene on the plane, you kind of get their interior monologues. And they're just so mean and bitchy about each other. It's hilarious. Like, basically, Venetia Kerr is saying of the Countess of Aubrey, like, bloody little tart. Her cloak, you know, it's it's like, she's like, oh, yeah, she's just this sort of, like, slapper, this slut who's married this, like, guy who I love, who's an aristo, who's worth more than her. And it's it's just really harsh, but really, I think, true to how maybe not just women right they're just how people if they're honest can think about other people who are their rivals so I kind of like that honesty I thought that was quite fun to read um Hannah any favorite characters we haven't mentioned or anyone else otherwise I I will go through the rest of the the characters well I will say and perhaps this might should be saved for the spoiler section but I did have a hard time finding myself liking any of the characters because I couldn't figure it out who they were (laughs) so I like I really wanted to like Jane Grey, but I really thought she might have done it for a lot, like most of the book. Uh, I was like pretty convinced, like this is all a ruse. And like poor Rose just keeping her close, you know, like uh well, that kind of thing. That, um I just say I at the end I kept I kept you close for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so I I did like Mr. Clancy though. I I'm like, how can he not? He's just such a scatterbrain and sort of the comic relief. And then um, even though this is one with Miss uh, Inspector Jap, we get a lot of Miss Monsieur Fournier in this, and I like that. Yeah. Um, another, and he, another... he's he's kind of a good sidekick, kind of a very strong, uh, sobering presence to Perot. Um, I think they're like very like minded, so he's very validating for Perot in a way that like Jap and Hastings normally aren't. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I I enjoyed that dynamic greatly. But yeah, Mr. Clancy is probably hands down my favorite. So let's run through the characters. So we've got on the plane, you've got Hercule Poirot, um, basically spends most of the flight just like in suffering from, you know, turbulence or asleep and doesn't really see what's going on. You've got Jane Grey, who is a young hairdresser in a stylish Mayfair salon. She's just won the Irish sweepstake. Um, and she's a working class woman, right? She's worried for being mixed up in the murder. She thinks it might lose her business. People won't want to be associated with her. But she's got a lot of common sense um, and she likes the adventure. And then we have Norman Gale, who is a dentist. Um, they actually meet. They, they've been in the south of France at a gambling resort called Le Pinay. And um, he's meant to be very good looking. Um, although um, I love Gladys, who is Jane Grey's best friend, who says anyone can have a brain- brown face. It may come from the seaside or it may have come out of a bottle, two shillings and 11 pence at the chemist's. Handsome men are slightly bronzed, says Gladys. I was kind of surprised that there were like fake suntans in those days, actually, come to think of it, of things that were ahead of their time. Um, yeah, have, me too. Yeah, and that men, men were known to like affect bronze skin. Hilarious. I mean, and then I guess they used to do it with white. Yeah, so why not, right? Powered uh, wigs and shit. Yeah, so the Countess of Horbury, a coked up gambling addict who hates Venetia Kerr. Um, actually, later on, one of the characters will say of her quite bitchily, but I think quite well. I know her type well. You see it sitting around the back of our table. The soft face, the hard expression, and 15 years. She lives for sensation, that one, for high play, perhaps for drugs. So the idea that she's a little bit past her prime and that hard living is taking its toll. We get Honourable Venetia Kerr, who's proper old money, sort of Downton Abbey, Lady Mary style. Um, the, The same guy says of her, her clothes are very well cut, but rather like a man. In my head, uh, Venetia Kerr looks like Catherine Hepburn. She walks about as though she yeah. owns the earth. She's not conceited about it. She's just an Englishwoman. 
And I think this is Agatha Christie being very good at like piercing the snobbery of upper class English people. She knows which department of England different people come from. It is true. I've heard ones like her in Egypt. What the et ceteras are here, the Yorkshire et ceteras or the Shropshire et ceteras. And it is, it's very much that kind of like, oh, I know the county set. I know the Aristos. And you can see that even today. Like, I know people like that. And I think Agatha Christie is really wonderful because she makes her heroine the working class hairdresser and makes and really takes the piss out of the snobbery of the Aristos. And I like I like that, that she's very socially satirical, I guess. Um, we have a Mr. Ryder who's having trouble in business. You've got Dr. Bryden who's on the plane and can go to the murdered victim. We have Mr. Clancy, who Hannah says she loves, the detective writer. He actually owns a blowpipe and knows about curare for research. He eats a lot of bananas. <laughs> um, very chaotic, but also actually highly perceptive and observant. And this is the first of the detective characters that Agatha Christie is going to include in her novels as a meta-narrative on herself. And she'll later have a character called Ariadne Oliver, who's even more kind of Agatha Christie-ish, except she will be addicted to apples. So I think Agatha Christie, it shows her like increasing confidence that she feels that she can start almost satirizing herself as a world famous detective. Um, and then, as I said before, you've got the DuPonts, they're French archaeologists. The son has an attractive boyish personality. And then last but not least, we have Madame Giselle, the moneylender, who is scrupulously honest, incredibly rich, a powerful businesswoman and a public figure. Like people know who she is. And she makes her living lending money, money to maybe famous aristocrats or stars who want discreet money lending. And she always gets paid back because she always holds information on the people that she lends to and will threaten to release it if they don't pay her back. But once they do pay her back, she destroys it. So she does play fair. We know that she lost her lips to smallpox. Um, and she is the murder victim on the plane. So as the plane is traveling from Paris to London, um, at some point there's a wasp in the plane that seems to distract people. And then they find that she, they think she's asleep when it comes to pay the stewards for the meal. Um, and then it looks like a wasp has maybe stung her on her nest, neck and that she's died from that. But then Hercule Poirot perceptive realizes there's a little kind of blowpipe dart um, at her feet and that a blowpipe is then found actually tucked into Hercule Poirot's seat. So people are saying, oh, my goodness, what if someone blew a poison dart at her in the air carriage? And Hercule Poirot is obviously deeply affronted that he could come under suspicion. So he resolves to solve the crime of why Madame Giselle, the moneylender, would be murdered. Um, so that sets up the mystery. And I think it's it's a really cool one. We'll get into the solution after, in the spoiler section, uh, boys and girls. Um, I will say mm -hmm. that uh, this this part is accurate. So security is was nowhere near like it was today in the 1930s. Uh, from arriving at the airport to being on your plane and taking off could sometimes take as little as 10 minutes. They would not search bags of people. They would just weigh them to make sure that they had enough fuel to carry them wherever they were going. So they couldn't be overweight with their fuel consumption. That would be the only thing that they would check at the airport. There's a lot of classic Poirot here. Uh, Xander, some other moments I was really thinking of you. At one point, Norman Gale, the dentist, says to Poirot, you cannot know that. And Poirot says, mon cher, practically speaking, I know everything. <laughs> oh, love that guy. That's classic. So flipping classic Poirot. I also just love the revelation that the blowpipe was stuffed under his seat and him and, uh, um, what was his name? Uh, Jap. And he's like, surely, you know, you didn't do this. This isn't your work. And he's like, if it was, this isn't how I would do it. You know, it was just <laughs> so good. <laughs> I flippin' love that guy. Um, there is one moment as he's described, I think, by Christy as exquisitely dressed in the most dandy cool style. And I've never seen, I know what like dressing like a dandy or being dandified is, but the like the word dandy cool style I thought was so good. And it's something they really get in the in the David Suchet TV adaptations where he's always dressed very fussy. How do you feel about Inspector Poirot, Papa Poirot, as we're now getting to know him? Does love to put couples together at the end of books. He likes to see everyone well settled. 
How do you feel about the fact that at some point he basically gives the archaeologists a bunch of money on the condition that they take give Jane Grey a job? I mean, without asking her if she wants to be working on an archaeological dig. I mean, it's a pretty high-handed way of going about things, Xander. Or do you still love him regardless? No, I think I think he's a romantic in all aspects. I mean, he may only know private investigating, but he, he, he's... Uh, He's still trying to do the right things. Yeah, he has a very conservative kind of socially, like he wants to see couples happily married. And yeah, he he is quite sweet in that way. But I was just like, how, like he just literally sold off Jane Grey to a bunch of archaeologists. What the hell? (laughs) Um, Which probably segues us nicely into how the text holds up to a modern reader and um i have to say as all well not as always some books are better than others there were a lot of pretty nasty points um you know a lot of talk about curare being employed by the natives um jack calls the duponts seedy little frenchmen um at one point one of the two says foreigners you can't trust foreigners even if they are the police (laughs) they're very there's a lot of (laughs) anti-foreigner sentiments in this one particularly amongst the working class which i think Robert yeah. of the time. Which but, is crazy um, because didn't they just fight with the French against the Italian in World War One? So I know, but still foreign. It was very it. awkward for me. I know. Henry the Steward says, Who's to know what reason foreigners have for murdering each other? And if you ask me, I think it's a dirty trick to have done in a British aeroplane. <laughs> right. Like, God forbid someone died, but, you know, did they have to do it on a British aeroplane? Right. And then I think this is a real sign of the time, like the rising threat of communism and Stalin. Like his wife says, if you ask me, there's Bolshies at the back of it. And I thought, this is like flipping McCarthyism in the States after the war, isn't it? Like I, anything dodgy goes on must be communists. You know? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. But it's so dodgy. But I think here, I think here, Christy is satirizing those people. I don't think she shares that opinion, but... It is pretty pervasive. Um, But anyway, let's get to the nastier bit because there are nastier bits. Um, Jean works as a hairdresser and he he pretends to, um, like, you know, be a French hairdresser called Antoine, but, quote, his only claim to foreignness is being half Jewish, end quote. I think very, I don't know, when you think of what's going on in Germany in this year, in 1935 and in this period, And you see that even in England, just by being Jewish, you're not really English, are you? Because you're actually Jewish, you're other. I think that's kind of pretty sad to read in a mainstream book that was hugely popular. So evidently must have represented what a lot of people felt like. And then it's really nasty when Jean tries to, she becomes very popular in the hair salon because people want to have their hair done by this woman who's caught up in this salacious murder. And she asks um, Andrew for a rise, the Jewish guy, for a rise. And it's insinuated kind of like that typical anti-Semitic thing that Jewish people are tight. And um, one of the other hairdressers refers to him as, quote, I key Andrew, end quote, which is a really old fashioned but pejorative term for Jewish people, which I don't know when I read that. I mean, I haven't read the word I key in print or heard someone use that as an insult for a very long time. And it was just really horrible. Is it, is it like a shortened version of the K word? I key, I think it's like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, but definitely, yeah. not, a, not when, a, when that part came up, I was like, what does this have to do with Dwight D. Eisenhower? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We like I. Oh, well, bless you for, um, yeah, bless you for I not, didn't understand not it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it basically, I think Ikey is short for, as a nickname for Isaac, and therefore it's like calling when a lot of Brit- English people can pejoratively refer to Irish people as paddies, because a lot of them are called Patrick, so nicknamed Paddy, but it's not meant in a nice way. It's meant in a kind of, oh, it's another Paddy. Like it's, so I think that's kind of. Oh, you know, or like he's a Mick. Yeah, exactly. But like Pardon. totally, totally not in a nice way. Um, but anyway, this is so the reason, Xander, that I think I have, like, you know, I read these books. I know they're from a century ago. So, and I still love reading them and I value them for what they show us so that, about that period. And I, I never really noticed phrases like this getting in the way of me loving a character. But I really struggle with this book and the characters because I think I don't get on with Jean Grey, even though she's smart and amazing, because there's this passage where she's having um, a date effectively with the dentist, Norman Gale. 
And Agatha Christie says it's this amazing date. And we've all had first dates like this, right, where you meet someone and suddenly you realize that you like the same TV shows and you hate the same music and you love the same music. And, every, you know, it's like you agree and disagree and everything. You're like, finally, I have someone who gets me and understands me. And then she has this uh, phrase. They disliked loud noises, noisy restaurants and Negroes. They preferred buses to tubes. And it's the way that like liking black people could be something that is a taste that you could have equivalent to, hey, I like Mozart and I hate Negroes. And it was just the idea that they would bond on this hot first date over their hatred of black people. And I think when I read that, I kind of lost love for Jean Grey and I never kind of got it back. Um, and I don't think I really got it back for the book, although I appreciated its plot. So I don't know. I know all the books have racism in them, but or some of them do. But this one, I found it harder to get over this one. And I think it's because it was used as a bonding thing rather than just an insult. If that makes sense. I don't know. No, I agree. I'm like... So obviously it's something like that's always shocking to read. Um, and I'm by no means any like declarative voice on this. But when like, especially reading Agatha Christie, because you're right, there is like every book, there's racism. Yeah. Um, but to me, not only is it written a hundred years ago, but it's also by a very well off British woman, you know, yeah, high so colonial all, power. all things I cannot relate to because like a lot of the way I, I kind of go through life is like I'm an ignorant American from Chicago. So like, I don't know, it's, it's Chicago is one of the biggest melting pots for me or in my mind, you know, so like a lot of times when I come across things like this, I always assume it's because people don't see how I see. Yeah. Yeah. But in a way, I think that's the power of books like these, right? Because A, they're so enjoyable in their own right. Or maybe this one's slightly less than the previous one for Xander. But, and even for me, actually, I didn't enjoy this much as the last one. But um, in general, they, they hold up, right? And they're really good reads. But they do just, they just show you, like even reading George R.R. R. Martin from 20 years ago just shows you a little bit kind of how we all thought without even thinking about it. And as Xander said, you know, this is a very wealthy woman from a very, you know, from England at the height of its power right as a colonial nation so evidently there are going to be attitudes and in a way what I find refreshing is that she could be horrific like there's a lot of people you read in this period height of imperial England like John Buchan and other really mainstream famous authors of the time who are way worse who were like really right. really horrific and actually I think you just have to also as much as like talking about what is negative you have to really appreciate the positive and like right. I said this kind of her her characters weren't all posh aristos she really has a lot of working class heroines and that was radical you know you think of Sherlock Holmes and all these other famous detectives you know they were aristos they were well funded and like Lord Peter Whimsey um, but Hercule Poirot is just a common or garden working policeman like a working class policeman who came as we learned in the last book from a very poor family who through his own intelligence and hard work has achieved a position of wealth and it's really commendable right it's really meritocratic so I think there, there are things and all her you know even I was thinking of the dead woman Madame Giselle the moneylender it's kind of like a really admirable character in a way to be a powerful businesswoman to have conducted her business scrupulously um, you know these are these are cool characters to have created in the time so anyways let, let's get into the adaptations because there's some fun stuff here there is a 1992 edition of the Agatha Christie Poirot the TV series that we've referenced many times starring David Suchet as Hercule Poirot and it's really handsomely made they really do the playing very well they actually do get the Handley no they don't have a Handley page HB42 they actually get a Douglas DC3 because they couldn't find a Handley page uh, HB42 which is a bit of a shame but anyway they do try to recreate the plane which is cool um, it's very faithful so if you want to watch a really faithful version I would highly recommend it it's good fun. now wait a second is this the one that starts when they're in France and they go to the tennis match? Absolutely. So in a lovely little... So I started of- watching it, but I couldn't get past it because I'm like, no, we open up on the casino. No, they... Um, they go <laughs> I watched see like Fred 15 Perry. minutes of it and turned it off. <laughs> they go and see Fred Perry winning the French Open, which I think is really cool. But no, the, after that, if you had got past it, it's incredibly faithful. So Okay, um, I'll give it another go around. Give it another go. And then I listened to the John Moffat radio play. So you've recommended these all through the series 
Hannah and for the first time I actually listened to it and it was just absolutely amazing I love the way they do aren't they great the, the sound effects and just the whole atmosphere it's just really really lovely so love I'm now going to try and listen to the radio plays going forward because I really enjoyed it and again very very faithful but quite concise I mean the way they kind of distill distill it down I think is really impressive so um, yeah the ABC murders one is really great yeah really, can't really wait. good stuff can't wait to do it um so that's the adaptations. Um, talked a little bit about the characters. We're now going to sign off, dear listener. So I don't know if we would wholeheartedly recommend this one. I think we all liked bits of it and didn't like other bits of it. I think it is, most people would say it's like second tier, Agatha Christie, second tier Poirot. Um, but if you've if you've not read it and you're looking for a new Poirot to read, then it's worth having a go. It's not, it's not terrible by any means. It's just not yeah. in of you know first draw yeah I don't think it cracks like the top 10 no um, for me. but it's definitely mid-table I think but it is I fun would... you know yeah there's a lot it's... of fun to it and there's lots of really fun social stuff in there so definitely definitely worth a go so anyway goodbye dear reader and uh, we will maybe join you in the spoiler spoiler bit after the break So now we can get into who done it, and um, it's probably worth talking a bit about three act tragedy, which is what we discussed in the last episode. Because a lovely yes. listener, maybe the only listener on YouTube, <laughs> I have a note about this actually. Yeah, kindly, kindly wrote wrote to us, wrote a comment, and said the difference between the UK and the US edition is that in the US edition, um, you d- there's no kind of previous wife um, who is preventing a divorce and therefore remarrying because the divorce laws, I guess, are different in the US. So they didn't think that would be plausible. He's just a, a more psychopathically motivated murderer in the US edition. So the motive is very different. Um, so I thought I'd clear that up because we, we oh, I clearly didn't know what the hell I was talking about in the last episode. Hannah, do you have a, a note to add? Oh, just that in chapter seven of Death in the Clowns, um, there is a reference to three-act tragedy. Uh, Hercule Poirot says that his killer used a psychological moment to commit the crime. Yeah, which is very good. But the biggest giveaway, I think, when you know the plot, so who done it was Norman Gale. We realized that actually of all the suspects that Poirot was considering on the plane, and he does say at one point, well, no one really thinks of the stewards. They think of the actual passengers. And we realized that Norman Gale had his dentist coat in his briefcase. Why would he have that? And he had an empty matchbox. So he was keeping the wasp in the matchbox to, d- to release in the flight to cause a distraction. And he went to the back of the plane, put on his dentist coat and a bit of cotton wool in his cheeks to impersonate a steward, put an extra teaspoon on um, Madame Giselle's um, saucer and then sort of killed her while he was doing that because no one suspects the servants. And if you've read Three Act Tragedy and you know that Sir Charles Cartwright impersonated a butler kind of to do the same thing because no one suspects a servant, you actually realise that it's basically a very similar means of murder and that she's kind of working out the same idea again. And we also know, because we've been reading Christie a lot, that we never trust servants or actors. <laughs> right. So with that in mind... I, uh, I didn't yeah. pick up on that at all, but I did from the get-go... I was like screaming at the audiobook. They didn't use the damn blowpipe. <laughs> like that part I saw coming a mile away that it wasn't that uh, the blowpipe was actually used. It was inserted by hand, it was from this second one. I knew the blowpipe yeah. was a red herring. But I think it plays fair, right? Because we, of all the evidence that we hear, we hear lots of people give evidence, but we never hear Norman Gale give evidence. Um, he talks about how Poro can't be a detective because he doesn't do disguises. So we, we're alerted to the fact that disguise could be part of it. Um, on, on page 60 in my edition, which is a 300 page book, so quite early on, Jack already says that if the murder murder victim had a daughter and if the daughter had been on the plane she'd be suspected of suspected of killing her mum for the fortune and I think you know the more you read in Agatha Christie the more you realize it's usually that you've got to follow the money like it's it's pretty it's usually pretty straightforward when you try and figure out you know who did yeah. the murder benefit and if there's no I one was really up until the very end I was very on the track of like Jane Grey got into debt with her somehow mm. 
and was gambling yeah. to sort of repay it. I was like very much uh again, I I keep coming back to like Nick in in End House. Um Yeah. So, so I, think, like, I was once, pleasantly once surprised realized, it wasn't her. Yeah. And once we realized she's got a daughter who's now grown up, I think you're meant to suspect the young women. So I think you're meant to suspect Jean Grey. Xander, did you have any strong convictions as you went through or were you just along for the ride? So funnily enough, this is actually the first one I think I figured out. Wow. Um, really? Yeah. yeah. So, so the book edition I have has a wasp on the cover. Yeah. So does mine. Uh, yeah. yeah. So does my audio book. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I was, you know, as I'm reading it, I'm like, fucking wasp. And the wasp comes up and I'm like, oh, that's the wasp is a red herring. This is nothing. What the fuck is this? You know? And then I think what, what, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what kind of made me figure it out was when, uh, Poro checks the lists and um yeah it's the dentist coat that that kind of really I tips it over and listened to that three times and i to pick up on what he was looking for and i didn't get it good for yeah, you for, I, I, you yeah, got I it from the dentist coat wow yeah, yeah good for you wow that's amazing because there's a point where Poro says i basically figured it out from the contents of all the briefcase right. bags but he doesn't say what maybe it's better you, if you can see yeah. it learn, yeah and, and i did what you did hannah i went back and looked at the list yeah and bear in mind, I, I've I thought about before. looking it up and looking at a physical list and I didn't and I thought about trying to write it down and I didn't maybe I should have but yeah good job Xander wow because I knew that the blowpipe well couldn't be, as soon as they say that there's a window on the plane and then you're like a little bit like so why didn't they get rid of the blowpipe and then you think okay so that's a red herring too um mm. but I don't think yeah I definitely didn't get that oh my god Xander that's so cool and then so did you realize that the daughter was the ma- the lady's maid not necessarily Silly. I kind of figured it's something um because again yeah. it's kind of similar to what she's done before mm. um but I think because the wasp was on the cover of the book and then as soon as the wasp kept coming up I knew it was a false lead um I, I don't know the yeah the Dennis coat it just it stuck out so much to me funnily enough the 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 one I wow. was you know least enjoying I figured it out <laughs> Well, maybe that's, that's right, because great. actually your brain yeah, was maybe, more yeah. free. Like you were not as emotionally engaged, so your brain was more free to kind of start detecting. Um, it is quite ingenious. And I do like the way she's sort of a little bit taking the piss out of outlandish murder plots, you know. Yes, we'll have a blowpipe and a rare Amazonian, you know. It's the sort of thing that if you were like 11 and trying to like write a murder mystery, you'd come up with something like completely outlandish like that. Well, I mean, she says as much when is Inspector Jap is saying, you know, talking about the the one writer dude who's so excited because like he mm-hmm. wrote a book yeah. where the whole mystery was yeah. the bull pipe and the fingerprints, and you know, like it's just like these people to write these insane novels. And then she goes on to have just like the most ridiculous mortuary court scene ever. You know, <laughs> I uh, oh, gonna, I definitely you- figured that Clancy was being set up. So like I I thought it would come out that the murderer had read his book, knew he would be on the plane, like that kind of thing. And then I I probably should have guessed that there was something up with Norman Gale because I could tell that Poirot was trying to set up Jane and the DuPont boy. So I knew there was something, you know, Poirot's a romantic at heart. Yeah, it's more he romantic than a detective. Yeah. He, he wants good let people. Me, let me give you a secret. Nobody just gives up their winnings on a gambling table. <laughs> I mean, I could see if you're really wealthy and it's a small sum, like and she's a really hot chick girl, and yeah. you want to impress her. Yeah, exactly. No. I don't know. But it is it's funny, like, like in a, a lot of, for someone. In a lot of Agatha Christie books, that the men who are really good looking are not to be trusted. And I think it literally comes from her first marriage. Like she had so many proposals. Mar- I think she had three marriage proposals before she accepted Archibald Christie. And she accepted him because he was this dashing RAF pilot and he was very tanned and tall and gorgeous and he ended up just being a shitbag right a cheating scumbag and um and then she married this kind of like very plain and like sensible archaeologist and I think she sort of you always sometimes have these very dashing men these bronze men and when you see Gladys saying well you could have just got the suntan out of a bottle I think that's very much Agatha Christie saying don't trust everything with these really like good looking Adonis types they're not always everything crack up to be for sure not all the glitters is gold yeah well then she did end up with like a a nice younger man so she didn't do too badly right um 
Yeah. <laughs> I think the sedation is a, quite I have an anecdote about that. Oh, go for it. So uh, shortly after Christie's second marriage to Sir Max Malowin, Malowin? Malowin, yep. Um, uh, so in chapter 13, Poirot says, imagine a hotel in Syria where uh, there was an English man whose wife had taken ill and he had to be in Iraq himself. So he left his wife and went on so as to be on duty on time. Um, and the doctor thought it quite, he, or he thought it quite natural, but the Syrian doctor thought it barbaric. So this actually happened to Christy and her husband shortly after they were married. Um, this is an anecdote taken from their real life. Yeah, so he abandoned her when she was sick to go and fulfill an obligation. I reckon Philip would do that to me as well. Like, there's something, like, so English about that. Like, I can't possibly let people down when I've made a commitment, even though I'd be, like, frustrate in the bed, like, puking my guts out. Or something. No, I feel like if you know it, you're going to recover, you know, it's like, what good is it? Go, go on, you know? Yeah. It, uh, obviously, if you were actually on your deathbed, probably it would change it. But And actually, the, the novel we're coming to after ABC Murders is Murder in Mesopotamia, which is set on an archaeological dig, and we're going to get a lot of little good Agatha Christie, Max Mallowan stuff woven into that for sure. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, oh, well, there's I'm... also a reference to Murder on the Links in this book. Yep. The uh, Inspector Fourier. Yeah. Um, references Monsieur Girard in Chapter 6. Yeah. Um, Those are the ones I caught. And then obviously the murder on the Orient Express one that you already mentioned. Yeah, exactly. It's not like they could all have done it. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty much everything we have to say on this one, listener. Um, I still think it's quite a tricksy solution, I have to say. I do like it. And Xander, you'll be pleased to know that at the time, um, loads and loads of people wrote into Agatha Christie and said, you got the Amazonian blowpipe totally wrong. In reality, those blowpipes are like six foot long. They're, right. not, they're not these short little ones that you can tuck oh, into. Oh, yeah. And then doesn't she re like, she addresses it in one of her later books. Yeah, kind of so takes, when she takes the piss she, of herself. Yeah, so she then invents the character of Ariadne Oliver. He's a detective um, novelist. And Ariadne Oliver, I think it's in Mrs. McGinty's Dead, says, Oh my God, this one time I made up the story with this blowpipe and everyone wrote into me because I got it wrong. Oh God. You know, like, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is quite like meta meta Christy this. Just sure. her way of I saying that's really nerds. Fun, yeah. Nerd. That's sort of like the equivalent now of like, um, you know when people break the fourth wall or have a blooper reel out and you you feel like you're in on it kind of like I think that's great for fans yeah and that's what I love about as these as we're getting now into like the second decade of the novels you really do feel like you're part of this quite intimate friendly Christie verse and that there are lots of hints and lots of cross references and you know we're definitely having a bunch of fun at this point yeah. although I do think the tone becomes more sinister and darker in the next one and um yeah I think this is this was a nice bit of froth a nice bit of you know rich 1935 froth before we yeah. get to the, the next movie. the next is ABC right yeah absolutely and you ABC know is in my top five but yeah um, I think I think Xander from from my perspective we're now shifting even into a higher gear so you get this one yeah, we're going to get ABC Murders. And actually, even Murder in Mesopotamia is pretty good. But then we're going to get Cars on the Table, which a lot of people think is an absolute classic. Then we're going to get Death never on the Nile. never read that one. I've never read either of those, so I'm excited then, for that. Yeah, and then we're going to get Death on the Nile, which people are thinking are an absolute one. classic. Well, that's my all-time favourite. And then Appointment with Death, which is absolutely a humdinger. So between like ABC Murders in 1936 and Appointment with Death 1938, so it's only two years. And then we get, um, and then there were none 1939. So these are like, absolute cold stone yeah the golden age flipping classics like yeah. this is just it i like, am really glad that you enjoyed the radio play though as much as i do i think john moffat's oh, Poirot is class just like, absolutely absolute super. classic yeah and the jazz like every now and again the jazz interludes because those were like at commercial breaks basically so every now and again it's a little jarring because you have like uh particularly i think peril at end house um or maybe it's maybe it's three act tragedy it goes from like a pretty macabre scene and like a very serious scene and then it's like da 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 like <laughs> kind of jazz music segueing out of it so it can be a little jarring but um for the most I think part I, like I just think they're just so John, well done is John Moffat has quite a soft accent and I think sometimes people play Hercule Poirot so bombastic Kenneth mm -hmm. Branagh does that in particular and I kind of prefer the John Malkovich the John Moffat style softer Poirots because I think he yeah. knows he's clever like he doesn't need to shout about it I mean he does sometimes mm -hmm. make these zingers 
that are quite arrogant. But in general, he's quite unassuming. In general, he usually says stuff like, well, you know, I've read the list of what's in the briefcases and I, I think I've figured it out, but I just need to test a few ideas. But, right. you know, he carries himself it's actually so in a puffed way, you know. But it has this huge presence too. Like it's it's so natural and he really paints the character well, the way he vocalizes things. Like mm. I really can see it in the radio plays uh, and I enjoy them immensely. Anyway, my gorgeous friendly Christy versus friends. This this is just a joy. So even on a book that I didn't enjoy that much, it didn't matter because I knew I was going to have fun talking about it with you mm-hmm. guys. So, yeah, um, I'm Santa really grateful just... to be included in this. It's given me a new vigor for Vok. Oh, well, I'm hey, so happy. I mean, okay. this has been a hell of a lot of fun with two of my favorite people. And oh, it's exactly. absolutely been the most amount of books I've read in six months or something. And oh years you know <laughs> well it's, it's fun just, and it it's manageable because they're short you know yeah. so. i really look forward to i really look forward to these little catch outs so xander ra- raise the raise the flag of book when you feel you're kind of getting towards the end of abc and i'll i'll do a reread and we'll reconvene but um in the mean i you know i love you all and i love this this is just a bunch of fun so <laughs> Thank you.